Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to the Sheffield Museum. And do we have Charles Ingalls in the house? We do. We, we actually thought Jacob Sykes was who you wanted. So uh, we quickly. Oh, no, we'll take Jacob Sykes. Oh, you don't know if Charles whoever we have conjured right. up. Charles Ingalls, just by chance, happens to be here as well. So it's it's easy to get him in here if you want. Who would you like to hear from, boys and girls, Jacob or Charles? Charles from the books. Sure, you gave him such a wonderful introduction. It, it, uh, we don't want to waste that. Well, both. Well, we'll see what we can do. So welcome, Mr. Ingalls, Pa Ingalls. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's very exciting to be talking to you people in the future. And, you know, in my time, I figure that we're pretty technologically advanced. We've got the railroad and the telegraph, but uh, you folks are way ahead of us with, with this. Uh, I don't even know what to call it. Um, you know, people are using electricity. This is the year 1882 and people are using electricity, but only in a very few places. You have to be very rich. And most of us are farmers in this time. And uh, quite a few of us are pioneer farmers. And there is no way that we're going to get electricity uh, anytime soon. I, I'd be surprised if I ever have it in my house. But if you live somewhere like New York City, uh, you might be lucky enough to live in, in one of the places where they're starting to hook it up. But anyway, no, it's very exciting uh, to meet people from the future. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, if you want to know about being a pioneer, then you've come to the right fellow because I've been a pioneer all my life. And uh, as Mally was saying, uh, you know, pioneering in Canada is not that much different from being a pioneer in the United States. Uh, you know, Canada, you know, at this time has opened up the prairies and that's where I've been settled for the last part of my life, uh, for the last 10 or 20 years, we've been moving around to different uh, areas on the prairies. And it's the very same, being a pioneer in the, on the prairies in Canada and the United States is basically the same. Uh, so we use the same tools and uh, the, you know, the weather conditions and the farming, it's, it's all the same. Uh, the government's different, of course, but uh, that, that doesn't make a huge difference for, for us pioneers. The way they give the land out is very similar to the same size, uh, farms and, and everything. So uh, whatever you folks want to know about being a pioneer, I'm happy to tell you. And I'll just give you a brief little uh, summary of my life so far. Uh, I've been told that you might, some of you or your parents might have read about me. Uh, you know, I had no idea that my daughter, Laura, was going to write books about our family's adventures as pioneers. and. Uh, to be honest, she hasn't done it yet, you know, in, in my time in 1882. Uh, she is only 15 years old right now. And she is um, just about, well, she's basically finished school and she's gonna be starting out as a teacher next school year. She's gonna have her own school. Now, I think there's only gonna be six students at her school. And uh, the school is probably about the size of this, this corner that I'm standing here in my barn. Uh, but anyway, she's excited and uh, she wants to help. Uh, well, she the, the money that she makes, she says she's going to give a lot of it to her sister, Mary, uh, who is blind, uh, so that we can send her to uh, a college for the blind where she'll learn a lot of, of good um, skills that she can use. So anyway, that, that's what Laura is up to right now. <clears throat> uh, but no, myself, I've moved around a lot. That's uh, you know, some pioneers are just, they make one move, you know, they, you know, they might come over from across the, the ocean, they come over from Ireland, say, and, and they get a piece of land and they settle there as pioneers and they stay there and that, that's it and that's fine. Uh, but for me as a pioneer, uh, my wife says I've got an itchy foot. I, I don't like to stay in one place for too long. So we've traveled all over the place and I don't know, how many times have you folks moved there in, in your lifetime? Since I know that you can send messages in to, to Mali there, I, I would be curious to know uh, how many moves you've made in, in your life. And uh, 
I'll tell you that I've moved, I've, I counted it up recently, 17 times uh, I've moved in my lifetime. Now my, and, and just let me know when you get any answers there. But- Elise uh, says zero. Oh, <laughs> wow. So that's, uh, well, I was at zero until I was about eight years old. Dolores says zero. Gabby says once. Oh, well, that's good. You know, it, I, you know, there's my wife is not happy about how many times we've moved. You know, you got to pack all your things up in a wagon and, and haul them around and set everything up again. You know, a lot of times. And Charlotte, uh, said, Charlotte said once she's never moved, but her dad moved eight times. So he must be a pioneer, too. Right. I uh, have a bit of an itchy foot like me, perhaps. <clears throat> well, the thing is, you know, some people are pioneers because, uh, you know, necessity. They they have um, moved from somewhere. Maybe they didn't like where they were and they wanted to, to make a, a new start somewhere. And then they're happy with that place where they've, they've started. Uh, for me, a lot of it is that I really, I love the wilderness. I, I love being out in the wild. And not everybody loves that in my time. A lot of people hate it. They, they think that the wilderness is, is scary and kind of evil. Um, how, how do people feel about that in the future? How many of you like being in the wilderness, going out where people don't live and it's all wild and, and untamed and there's lots of wild animals around, and, uh, you know, lots of things to explore? Uh, that, that's part of my reason that I move around so much is that once you've stayed in an area for a few years, uh, you know, more and more people move in and it's not really wilderness anymore. It's getting more and more settled and there aren't so many animals around anymore, uh, wild animals. Uh, so that's when I start wanting to, to move on. Uh, so when I was, um, where I was born, I was born in New York State uh, back in 1836. And uh, from there, my family moved out to Illinois. And uh, there's actually a bit of prairie in Illinois. And uh, that's, that's when I first kind of fell in love with the prairie. Uh, I just like the big open spaces there. And uh, from there, we moved into Wisconsin. And, and we moved around a few times in Wisconsin. And then into Minnesota. <clears throat> um, if, if you've read my daughter's books, I guess the, the one little house in the big woods, we're, we're in Wisconsin, um, near the Mississippi River. And then after that, we move into Minnesota. And that, that's where a lot of the other ones are. Uh, and now we're living in, well, it's gonna be South Dakota, but right now it's not a state yet, it's just a territory. So it's called D Dakota Territory. They're gonna split it into, into two. How many of you have ever been into uh, South Dakota or North Dakota before? Anybody been there? I know it's a bit out of the way and, and a lot of uh, people don't go there in my time, uh, except that there's a bit of a gold rush happening right now as well. So some people are coming for that, but where we are living, there's no gold. Uh, we're living, we live in a railroad town called Desmet. And uh, that's a very handy way of being a pioneer is, is living on the railroad. because They'll bring a lot of supplies in that you need on the railroad. A lot easier than it was back in the forest in uh, Wisconsin where we live or in, in New York. So anyway, that, th my wife made me promise no more moves. We're stuck here. This is where I'm gonna die, she said, here in, in uh, South Dakota. So uh, that's fine, I, I had a good run. I'd love to go further west. You know, people are going out to Oregon and all the way, you know, maybe to California or somewhere. But no, this is where I'm going to stay now. I'm I'm getting a bit older, and and uh, being a pioneer gets a lot harder when when you're not as uh, as strong. And and uh, anyway, I've gone on about my my life uh, enough. There, we'll see what you folks want to know about. I can show you the tools that pioneers use. Uh, you know, things for working. Uh, I've got some things for having fun with here as well. And, um, you know, anything at all that you like. It, it's been quite a, an adventure. And uh, I'm happy to share whatever you want to know about. Right. So, uh, 
let me know if there's any questions so far and uh, mm. otherwise I can tell you other things. So Charlotte and Isaiah would like to know, and, and I remember from reading in the books, what kind of wild animals have you seen and was that scary? Oh, oh now that, that's an interesting subject. Um, yeah, there are a lot of wild animals and some of them are not scary um, at all, of course. Uh, and they're quite useful for food. Uh, so we hunt a lot of deer, you know, there's a lot of deer in the forest uh, and on the prairie as well, you get some. And rabbit, uh, there's a lot of rabbit here on the prairie. So we, uh, a lot of our meat comes from, from hunting them. A lot of wild birds as well. And uh, we rely on them for, for food too. Uh, wild turkeys are quite plentiful. And there's um, geese and ducks and pheasants and pigeons. Uh, we fish when possible as well. If we have um, somewhere to fish, we'll get as many fish as we can. And I've built fish traps before. So you, you can just go and, and empty the trap and then we, we salt the fish uh, and pack them in barrels. Uh, so you, you don't have to go hungry. Um, we also trap uh, furs. And I've, I've done a lot of fur trapping in my life and you can make some good money that way. You can trade furs at your general store, wherever the nearest general store might be. Uh, so I, I trap, um, you know, a lot of mink uh, that are in the area. Uh, so anyway, the, the ones that are a bit more scary, of course, there's bears and uh, we hunt them as well because there's a lot of meat on a bear. Have any of you ever eaten uh, bear meat before? Just uh, curious to know. Uh, fur, of course, you can make a wonderful bear skin uh, rug or a coat. Uh, I've got a good bear skin coat myself. It's, it's the warmest coat I've ever had. Um, uh, uh, it said no, they've never eaten bear. Oh, all right. Well, if you get a chance, give it a try. So, you know, so you can say you've done it at least. Uh, they are, of course, kind of dangerous and you have to watch out. Uh, one time I was uh, coming home in the dark, but well, I was just getting dark uh, along a trail. And this was when we lived in the forest. There were, that, that's usually, you don't find bears out here on the prairie very much, but uh, it was getting a bit dark, so I couldn't see so well. And I was coming along and uh, up ahead of me, I, I, there was a bear on the trail, I saw a bear. And, you know, usually bears get out of your way, you know, they, they don't wanna mess around with you uh, unless you provoke them or unless they're really hungry. Uh, but this bear wasn't moving. So I, I was a little bit worried and uh, I got closer and closer, it still wasn't moving. And uh, I, I thought, oh, you know, what should I do here? If I go off the path, then there could be more bears that I'm not going to be able to see as well because we're out in the open here. And so, I, I, you know, I tried to scare it away. I was shouting and, and waving my arms and it just stood there. And, you know, I couldn't see it that well. And uh, eventually I realized that it was just a stump in, in uh, the middle of the trail and in the dark, my eyes had played tricks on me. So, you know, that's kind of silly in the end, but I've had some really scary experiences with uh, another kind of a wild animal uh, and well, which one to tell you, uh, one night when we were living out in Minnesota, uh, no, sorry, it was Kansas. We were living in Kansas at the time. Uh, in the middle of the night, I was woken up, woken up with this horrible scream and it, it sounded like uh, a woman was being murdered. Not very nice. Uh, of course, even to talk about, <clears throat> but uh, it was just horrible, this screaming. And so I didn't understand what was going on. It wasn't coming from inside our house. So my family was all safe. But I thought, oh, well, you know, could this be at our neighbors? Our neighbor was about a mile away. So, I, you know, it was pretty loud, but I thought, well, I got to go and see what's going on. So I, I went out and uh, walked over to the neighbors and it was completely silent. They were obviously asleep in there and the sound had gone. 
wasn't hearing it anymore. So I walked back and uh, just about at my, my house and passing under one of the few trees that was out there on the prairie in Kansas. And I heard the scream again, but this time it was coming from right above me in the tree. And I didn't even look up because now I knew what was going on. Any of you know what was making that screaming sound? What, what screams similar to a woman screaming? Mm, they might know that. I hope you haven't had too many encounters with, with these creatures, but that's what they sound like. Well, wait, if you don't know, is it a kind of a cat? Yeah, yeah, it's a cat, a wild cat. Um, well, we call them panthers. Uh, there's there's mountain lions, um, but these are panthers, and uh, they're very dangerous. They, you know, sometimes will wait in trees, and then they'll jump down on somebody as they're passing up under the tree. Or, or an animal, you know, they'll jump down on a deer. So I was extremely scared. Uh, I, like I said, I didn't even look up to see this thing. I just took off like a shot. And I'm, I'm not kidding you, all of the hair on my head stood straight up, went right up uh, when, when that happened, when I heard that sound. And I just took off, I ran like I'd never run before and uh, got inside. And you know you can't outrun them really, uh, but what saved my life probably was that that this panther wasn't actually hungry. Uh, if it had been hungry, it probably wouldn't have made any sound and it would have just jumped on me and I wouldn't have seen it coming at all. Uh, so that was very scary. Even though you know really my I guess my life wasn't in danger because it wasn't hungry. Uh, you don't want to come too close to those things. Uh, my my grandfather was chased back in uh, Wisconsin by one when he was riding a horse through the forest, and it was uh, he was riding through the forest on the horse, and it was chasing him in the trees. It was jumping from branch to branch, and uh, he just made it back and, and got inside. It actually jumped on his horse and and started attacking his horse uh, before he he got his gun and, and shot it. Uh, so, I don't know, uh, are there any panthers where you folks live in, in your area that you have to worry about? Uh, where, where I've lived, uh, unfortunately, there have been. In New York, we had panthers. In, uh, uh, in Wisconsin, and even out on the prairie, uh, further south, there's panthers too. So, uh, well, Delure might have some. Are there any wildcats? Oh, Owen and Aiden say they have cougars. Charlotte and Isaiah said they have deer and coyotes. Cougars are uh, similar to panthers, correct? Yes, yeah, cougars, um, I haven't seen them b before. Uh, they, I think they're a bit further north uh, than where I've lived, but, uh, and I don't know if they're as dangerous or not, but uh, I mean, any of them, you know, can be quite dangerous because they, they can kill a person quite easily, so. Um, it's nice if you live somewhere where you don't have to worry about them. <clears throat> um, and you mentioned coyotes. Uh, we we have uh, out here in Dakota Territory a few coyotes, uh, wolves as well. And uh, wolves have been, have been around most of my life too. Uh, they are more usually more of a danger for your farm animals. So you have to make sure if you've got animals that are vulnerable, like sheep, that, that they're kept in a good fenced in area. Uh, there was a time in uh, Kansas where a pack of wolves was um, running along where, where I was riding my horse. Uh, once again, I was fortunate. These were what we call buffalo wolves that, that hunted uh, buffalo back when there used to be a lot of buffalo. Uh, lucky for us, the, um, they weren't hungry, and uh, they because they, you know, a pack of them could have finished us off pretty easily. Uh, but at that that time, they weren't looking for food. 
but they did come around. They circled our house one night and, and they stood, you know, in a circle howling at us one night when they were hungry. Uh, so that was scary as well. And uh, one thing you need to have, I recommend for anybody who's going to be a pioneer, uh, is to have a good dog, a good watchdog, uh, because they will let you know when trouble like that is around. And their, their barking will sometimes uh, keep uh, predators away and, and sort of scare them off a bit, depending on how hungry they are. Uh, but at, at the very least, they provide you with warning when there's something dangerous around. And uh, also for uh, human predators, you know, when you're a pioneer and you go out into the wilderness, sometimes there's not a lot of law and order. And some people will take advantage of that. And, uh, you know, the biggest problem is stealing. People will, will try to steal things and, and figure they can get away with it. But if you've got a good watchdog, then uh, that usually keeps people from, from stealing from you. All right, great question. Those, those are some of the more exciting things about being a pioneer. And uh, luckily, we've, we've survived them all. <clears throat> Elise wants to know, do you have links where you are? I've heard of that kind of a, a wildcat, but actually I might have seen one one time. There was one that I thought was a lynx. They're a bit smaller than a, a panther or a cougar. And uh, there's the what we call a mountain lion. They're, they're a bit smaller as well. Uh, another name for them is the, um, the, the catamount. So yeah, they, they come in different different sizes, these wild cats, but the I think the cougars and the panthers are the the biggest ones. And uh actually one time my uh my sister-in-law uh almost got eaten by a panther. Uh she was going down, they had just settled in Minnesota and she was going down to a spring to get water because they didn't have time to dig a well yet. So when you first settle. Uh, it's good if there's some kind of a natural source of water, you know, a creek or a, or a spring where water just comes up out of the ground on its own, because it takes a while to dig a well. You know, sometimes you've got to dig down 30 feet with a shovel uh, to get the water. So anyway, she was going down to this spring with a couple of buckets. Actually, I got something here that uh, I was going to show you. I I'd be surprised if you folks still have to work with uh, hauling buckets of water for your animals there in the future. But uh, in my time, you spend a lot of time, especially when you're a pioneer child, hauling water. And this is called the bucket yoke. So it's nicely carved so it, it rests on your shoulders and you can put padding in it too to make it more comfortable. And then you can hang a bucket from each of these hooks here. So that's the that's what she was doing. She was going down to the spring to get water for, for cooking. And uh, her dog was there. And uh, all of a sudden the dog uh, went in front of her and stopped her from going down the path. And she didn't really understand what, what was going on. She thought the dog had gone kind of crazy. And she tried to get past the dog and the dog actually uh, bit her dress and, and held onto it and wouldn't let her go. And was growling really fierce at her. Uh, so she got scared of the dog and she went back in the house and uh, she, she was in there. She wasn't sure what to do. And so uh, <clears throat> she tried to go back out again and the dog was right there at the door growling and snarling at her. And she said that, uh, you know, if she'd had a gun, she would have shot the dog because she figured it'd have rabies. Um, but her husband, my brother Peter, he was out hunting at that time, so he had the gun. So anyway, she stayed in the house for a few hours and uh, everybody was getting really thirsty. Some of the, the younger children were crying. So she, she decided to try again. And uh, this time when she went out, the dog was back to normal and just walked alongside her down the path. And when they got down to the spring, she finally realized what had been going on because she saw the tracks of a panther in the snow down by the spring. And uh, she realized that the dog had been protecting her from going down there. And the dog knew that the, the panther had, had moved along. There was a tree there, so it was probably waiting in a tree at one point for you know deer come by to drink from, from the spring as well. So 
uh, it, it was it, it wasn't going to be fussy about who it was going to jump down on. But, uh, again, a, a dog can save your life. And, uh, I strongly recommend having one if you're going to be a pioneer. I don't know if you folks that was uh, that was that great uh, explanation and it sounds like a wild adventure out there. Uh, Charlotte and Isaiah would like to know, did you have to move away from your mom and dad and can you ever see them again since you've moved so many times? That's, uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, a lot of pioneers will move away and uh, quite often they never do see their parents again, just because you, you might end up really far away and, and making that journey, you know, it, it takes, it can take months to, to travel uh, to see somebody. And, you know, you can't leave your farm unattended for months to do that. So uh, if, you're, if you're fortunate, maybe your parents have, have retired from farming and maybe they can somehow come and see you. Or if the, if the railroad is close enough to, to your area, then maybe they'll they'll travel, but no. Sometimes you you never see them again. So when you when you leave them, it, it can you know you both know that this could be the last time you see them, and uh, that can be pretty sad sometimes. So no, I well we we lived um, together in Wisconsin, and then I went off and um, started my own farm. But they were only a few miles away. <clears throat> uh, we were still in Wisconsin. We were still in the same county, actually. So uh, we still saw each other at Christmas. And that was, you know, for pioneers, Christmas is a great time for visiting because there's not as much work to do on the farm. So you can afford to take a week or two and, and go and stay with somebody. And that's usually what you do. You stay with them. You don't just go for a, a day because you know, you've traveled so far and you want to make the most of it. And winter, Christmas, uh, you know, is a great time to travel because usually the, there's a good layer of snow on the ground. And that's the easiest time to get around because there aren't a lot of good roads built yet. And uh, the, the snow makes a nice smooth surface for sleighs to go over. So sleigh riding is, is very, uh, popular with, with pioneers. And uh, at, around Christmas, there's a lot of people out traveling to, to visit, see people. Now, once we moved into um, <clears throat> Minnesota, uh, we still did sometimes make the, the trip at Christmas, but now way out here in Dakota territory, it's, it's really too far. So I probably won't see my, my parents again. Uh, but who knows? I, I don't know, you know, what, what's going to happen. Um, it's not as likely. Good question. Wow. Um, okay, students, do you have another question? Do you have, oh, do you have stores? Yes, yes. We call them general stores because usually they're not very specialized. They're not just for one thing. So they're general, they're, they, they have a bit of everything in them. And uh, they also will take things, you know, for trade. Farmers can trade things from their farm, uh, as well as furs. I, I think I mentioned before that I've done a lot of fur trapping. So you can trade furs for things that you need. And the, the general store is very handy because you might get the idea that pioneers do everything for themselves. Uh, we try to do as much for ourselves as we can, as is practical, but you know, it's, it's becoming more and more convenient to get some things at a store. Now, when I was growing up in the 1830s in New York, uh, most pioneers would make their own clothing <clears throat> from their own sheep, and, and they would do all that processing of the wool. So they would uh, they would shear their sheep with these shears, and then they would do all those things that you have to do: carding the wool, <clears throat> you know, brushing it out to get it straight, so that you can spin it. Uh, I don't have a spinning wheel here because we don't use them anymore. We do have a spindle still kicking around here. So I, uh, this is part of a spinning wheel. 
can actually use it on its own to, to spin, but really nobody's doing that anymore because it's so much work. And then you have to dye the thread the color you want it and weave it on a loom. Uh, but now it's so much easier, and, you know, with the railroads everywhere too, uh, it makes it a lot more um, sensible to just buy cloth from the general store. The cloth has been made in a factory somewhere in the east and it's it's already dyed, you know, and it's ready ready to cut and sew. And so most pioneer families are still, you know, the women and the girls are making their own clothing, um, but all they're doing is the cutting and sewing. Now there are shops, some in you know, in a railroad town like where we live, uh, we have a tailor shop and we have a seamstress. So, so they make, uh, the tailor makes clothing for men and the, the seamstress for women. Uh, but some people will still do the cutting and sewing themselves. Some will go there and, and have the, the clothes ready made. And I, I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say ready made because they'll make it to fit you. They'll measure you and, and make sure that the clothing fits you exactly. Uh, at a general store, uh, they do sometimes have clothes that are already made in a factory and uh, they won't fit you quite as well, quite as nicely as a, a tailor or seamstress can, uh, but they're cheaper too. So things are changing all the time here. You know, it, it's uh, more and more things are being made in factories and being a pioneer now is a lot different from, from when I was younger. There's, there's a lot more things that you can, you can buy that we used to make for ourselves. But of the general store, you know, They've got all kinds of uh, canned food. You know, it's very important when you first start on a pioneer farm, you need a supply of food because um, it'll take a couple of years at least to get your farm producing enough to feed the family. So you gotta have uh, food bought in, in those years. And so general store is very important for that. Uh, they sell all kinds of hardware that you can use, tools, uh, that you use on the farm, uh, gunpowder for, for hunting and, and so on. Um, just all kinds of things. And uh, so that's one of the most important businesses in, in a pioneer community is the, the general store. <clears throat> and we had a bit of uh, trouble last year. We had a really hard winter and the uh, there was so much snow. And I don't know, do, do any of you live in an area where there's blizzards. I don't know, I think it's mostly on prairies where you, where you get blizzards, but, but just let, let me know if you have ever experienced a, a blizzard before. But we had so many blizzards last winter, it, it, there was so much snow, the trains couldn't get through. And so we, the general store started running out of food. And being a pioneer community, you know, we were just in the first couple of years of settlement. Most of the families could not produce enough food for themselves. And we, we relied on that general store. And so people were getting very, very hungry and getting close to starving to death. And then uh, one young man from, well, no, sorry, two young men from the town um, went out and they heard that there was a farmer further to the east who had been settled for a few years and that he had extra grain that they could buy. And they went out in a blizzard and they, they did get some grain and, and brought it back and actually saved our town. And one of those guys, his name's Almanzo Wilder. And apparently my, my daughter, Laura, is gonna marry him. Uh, she doesn't even know that yet, but, but uh, I, I believe that her, her name when she writes the books is Laura Ingalls Wilder, uh, because she's gonna marry this guy. Uh, so anyway, he, he is a good guy, he saved us from starving that year. So uh, yeah, they would, these blizzards would come through, they would dump 30 feet of snow on our, our houses. You'd have to climb out a, a window upstairs or, or dig a tunnel to get out of your house. Uh, and then another blizzard would come around and it would just blow all that snow away again. It would be all gone. Uh, so they're, they're really crazy things. Uh, the children almost got lost in a blizzard coming home from school the one day. The, the blizzards come up so fast, there's very little warning. If you've got warning, you know, it, it's, it's good to take cover. And the children were coming home from school 
and the blizzard came along and they couldn't see. Usually in a blizzard, you can't even see the hand in front of your face. There's just so much snow blowing around and it's coming from all different directions. You don't know which way you're going anymore. And luckily the children, uh, what they did was, there was about uh, 13 of them. They, they joined hands and they made a, a wide line as they were walking um, because they didn't know where they were going anymore. And they knew that if they got out of town by accident, they would just be out on the prairie and then they would be really in trouble because there's no shelter out there. So they were hoping that by making a, a big line that one of them uh, would be more likely to touch a house and, and get shelter or some kind of building, a barn or a shed. And what happened was they walked and they walked and they were getting really scared because they thought that they were getting out into the prairie. and the last child on the one end of the line just barely touched the, the last house in, um, in town on the way out to the prairie. They came within a foot of missing it and, and would have ended out there and probably all those children would have froze to death. Because, um, well, probably you'll freeze to death. What you can do though is just keep walking. Uh, we call it walking out the blizzard. And uh, some people have walked for several days uh, and kept themselves alive. But what, what you're, it's gonna be really hard to uh, not just lie down and, and fall asleep. That, that's what eventually people will do. They get so tired and cold and they start freezing to death and they just, they just lie down. Uh, but you gotta resist that. Happened to me one time, I, I was on my way back home at Christmas and uh, a blizzard came up couldn't see where I was going anymore. So I just kept walking. I walked off the edge of a cliff and uh, luckily it wasn't too high and there was a big snow bank at the bottom. And that was a good thing because that gave me some shelter. I was inside a snow bank and that was uh, keeping me out of the wind. And I stayed in that snow bank for three days and uh, ate snow, ate some crackers that I bought in town, Christmas crackers. And uh, after three days, the blizzard stopped and I, I climbed out and there about 200 feet away, there was my house. I'd been really close to home, but just no way of seeing it in that blizzard. So that's another danger that, that pioneers uh, have to worry about out here on the, the prairie anyway, are, are blizzards. <clears throat> oh, Elise wants to know, it sounds like such a, uh, a hardship. Do you like being a pioneer? And maybe you can tell us some of the things that you do for fun, Charles, because it sounds like a lot of work. Sure. Now, yes. Now, I've I've been piling up all of the, you know, my most scary, terrifying stories all at once here for you. These happened over the course of of twenty years. You know, they didn't happen all at once. Uh, so don't get the wrong idea. But at the same time, you know, those dangers do exist. And uh, it, it, is, it is pretty wild and, and exciting at times. <clears throat> um, but, you know, a lot of times it's, it's just a lot of work, like you say as well. You know, there's a lot of work you have to do. And honestly, <clears throat> I've struggled quite a bit um, to be a successful pioneer farmer. We've had a lot of bad weather. Uh, a lot of dry weather where the crops haven't turned out. Uh, we had uh, basically a plague of, of grasshoppers in Minnesota. That, that's why we left there. And they, they destroyed our crops. Just, they ate everything. Once they ate all the crops, they started, they started eating people's clothing that was hanging out on their clotheslines. They started eating the paint off the houses. And uh, once again, the trains couldn't run because the ground was so thick with grasshoppers, they covered the railroad tracks. And once the trains hit these patches of, of grasshoppers, <clears throat> they, they crushed them. And there were so many of them that the, the train tracks got all slippery with crushed grasshoppers and the, the wheels of the train just started spinning and they couldn't go anywhere. Uh, so anyway, here I am again to, with, with dramatic stories, but that did happen. It's, it's just, uh, uh, there's been a lot of, of challenges, let's just say that. 
So yeah, when you're working so hard, it is important to have fun. And we, you know, we have fun with the family at home. <clears throat> we, you know, we tell stories. I, I tell my children a lot of stories. Uh, we have music, we, we sing, I play the fiddle and uh, the family sings along and, and as we, um, as I play the fiddle. What we really love to do though, um, especially is have a dance and usually we try to get a bunch of people together, not just your family, but um, the neighbors as well. That, that's something when we have our Christmas visits that, that there's usually a lot of dancing. But whenever we have, um, we have work bees, that, that's a very important part of being a pioneer. So yeah, we got a, we've got a hard job to do like building a log house or clearing some land, uh, doing some harvest work together. And uh, as a reward for our neighbors helping us, of course, we're going to help them too. That's part of how it works. But we're also going to have a party afterwards with lots of music and dancing. And the fiddle is considered the best instrument for dancing too. Uh, there's just something about it gets people going and wanting to dance. And I've played the fiddle all my life. Well, since I was a, a teenager anyway. And so I've gone around to a lot of dances. and. Uh, I'll just play you a tune here. This, this is a, a tune that you always get asked to play at a dance. People love this one. Uh, it's called The Devil's Dream. <clears throat> together wherever you are uh, you could do a, a sort of version of the kind of dances that we like to do <clears throat> I could uh, teach you the steps for one of my favorite dances which is the Virginia reel so um, yeah, and then if you're not you can remember these steps maybe and, and use them when you do have a few more people yeah can they try it because when um because you know, we have this thing called a recording so they can go back and look at it and share with their families when their families get together. Oh, really? Are you putting it on a, a wax cylinder like uh, Thomas Edison came up with? Uh, a little bit more complicated than that, but yep, the, it works sort of the same that we can hear and we can hear it again and see it again even. Oh, very good. Well, go ahead. Sure. Yes. And I'll, so I'll teach you the steps, and, and if anybody has at least uh, one person to dance with right now, they can try it now, or otherwise, as you suggest, you could you could play it back later. Uh, so a lot of our dances, well, there's different types. There's um, there's couple dances like waltzes, um, lancers, polkas, things like that. So that's where where there's two people dancing together, you know, holding each other. Uh, those are those are still popular in this time, uh, but I think what people like even better are the group dances, and uh, some of them are done in squares. There's square dances uh, where there's four couples that are facing each other around a square. Uh, there's circle dances that are popular. Uh, my favorite ones are what we call long dances, and they involve having two lines facing each other. So. What's the, um, the ideal number for a long dance is to have uh, two lines where there's four people in each line or maybe five or six people in each line. And then if you've got more than that, it's good to break it up into another group. 
so anyway, if you if you've got uh, two people, you can pretend that each one of you is a line facing across from each other. If you got four people, then you got two people on each side. And if you're lucky enough to have six people, then you can have three people on each side. You want to stand about uh, four feet apart from each other, the two lines, and, and the people in the line hold hands with each other. So my favorite long dance is the Virginia Reel. And it starts out with your hands joined with your line, and you go in four and back four twice. So you go four steps towards the other line, and you meet in the middle, and then you go four steps back to the side. And each step you take is on the beat, on the beat of the music, right? So you do that twice. You go in four and back four twice, and then you're gonna do a bunch of turns with your partner. So when you line up, uh, the person who's straight across from you is your partner on the other side. And so that's why you want to have the same number in each line. So everyone's got a partner. Uh, if you don't have an even number, <clears throat> then uh, the person who's at the bottom of the line, of one line, can just pretend there's someone across from them. And then once you go through all the steps, then it starts over again, and, and, but you rotate positions. So then that person at the bottom could have somebody to dance with. Hopefully you could work that out if you, for yourselves if you have an odd number. But anyway, after you go in four and back four twice, then you're going to do turns with your partner. The first turn you're going to do is a right elbow turn. So you're going to go into the middle, you're going to link right elbows around once with your partner and then back to your place again. So you put a bit of a skip in your step as you do that, it makes it more fun. And then you do the same thing with your left elbow, round once. And it, these turns usually take about eight counts. Um, and that kind of keeps you with the, with the music. And when the music changes, then it, that, it's usually at eight count uh, intervals. And then you do a turn with two hands. You join both hands with your partner, go around once, back to your place. And then you do what we call the do si do. <clears throat> now this has a, fran a fancy French name. It, I guess it means back to back. But what you're doing is uh, you fold arms, and then you go around your partner back to back. Now that's a little bit misleading because you stay facing forwards the whole time. You go in and then you go around each other back to back and then backwards to your place. It's hard to demonstrate that with only me by myself, um, but hopefully you can get the idea of how to do that. And then you're going backwards to your place. So you're, you're forwards, facing forwards the whole time. And then, uh, what happens next, there's variations that depends on how, how tricky you want to make this. Um, the full version is really fun, but it's a little bit harder to do at first. So you might want to do the simple version first and then uh, add this more complicated part in. The simple thing to do next is just a sachet down and back. So you've got to uh, decide which end of your dancers is the top and the top two the top person for each line they're going to come together in the middle and join both hands and they're going to sashay down to the bottom of the lines and then back up to the top again and sashay means they've got their hands joined and they're moving their feet side to side hopping to the beat as they go down to the bottom and then back up to the top again and the rest of the, the group will usually clap and cheer them on as they go. It's really fun. Uh, so that's the simple version, doing a, a, just a simple sachet down and back. If you want to add in the more fun but more complicated part, you just sachet down. And instead of sacheting back up, you are going to do a formation called the reel on your way back up. And um, what you're going to do for that is that that top couple, as they come up, they're going to do a right elbow turn with each other once around, and then they're going to go off to the opposite sides and turn the people there with their left elbow. So they'll turn the, the first people at the bottom of the line uh, around once with their left elbows. Then they'll come back to uh, turn each other with their right elbows, and then they'll go to the next person from the bottom of the line and turn them with their left elbows once, and then come back to each other with their right elbows. And you work your way back and forth up the line till you get back to the top. And then at that point, you do this uh, follow the leader type move. 
where everybody faces the top and the top person of their line leads the line around the back, follow the leader down to the bottom. And at the bottom, they make an arch. The, the two lines have both sort of peeled off down the back. And at the bottom, the two leaders meet and they make an arch by putting both hands up. And then everybody else comes through the arch with their partner together. And the ones who come through first go up to the top and back to the sides. Everyone else goes back to the sides in the same order. And then when everybody's gone through the arch, the leaders join the bottom of their line. And that's how we rotate positions in the dance. And so that, uh, that ends that uh, round of the dance, but then it starts over again from the very beginning. And you've got new people at the top and you start over now and everyone joins hands and you go in for and back for it twice. And then you do the turns. Right elbow, left elbow, two hand, do si do, and then the top two sashay down, and they can go back up if you want to keep it simple, or they can do the reel on the way back up, and then around the back through the arch into the lines again. And it just keeps repeating. And uh, usually we try to go through it a couple of times so everyone has a couple of times being at the top. Uh, so that, that can go on for you know five or ten minutes. <clears throat> So anyway, I'll play, I'll play again if you like. And if, if there's people there, um, even if there's just two of you, you know, you can go in, in and back towards each other. You can do all the turns with each other. You can do a sachet. Um, if you've got four people, then you can actually do a bit more and you can you know, go through an arch and so on. But um, I'll give you a few minutes here if you like. Of, um, I'll play some dance music here. And uh, you can do whatever amount of the Virginia reel you're able to. Or you can just listen to me play the fiddle if that's acceptable to you. <clears throat> Sorry, I gotta remember what tune I'm gonna play here. Oh yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Thank you. 
Awesome. I hope the boys and girls were able to do a little bit of dancing um, just to move along to the music because that was so much fun. But I guess, Charles, we have about two minutes left. So um, I don't know. Are there any last questions? Oh, they danced at Charlotte's house. I was wondering if anybody danced. So, so if some of you were dancing, that's great. And it is fun. It's really fun when you can do it together. Yes. Yeah, I highly recommend it. I don't know if you still do dancing like this in the, the future, but really, I, it's our favorite thing to do. Oh, and they asked about maybe the last question before we go is jobs around the farm or the town. And maybe you can show us a couple of the tools that you might use. Sure, sure. So um, the girls, uh, around the farm, they usually work closer to the house and look after the garden and milking the cows and making butter and cheese, uh, preparing the meals, looking after the younger children. Uh, they, they work on making clothing, as I was mentioning before, too. <clears throat> um, my daughter, Laura, actually, I didn't, I don't have any boys, uh, so she actually helped me out in the fields a little bit which my wife, Carolyn, was not pleased about because she said, you know, that's not ladylike. I'm trying to raise Laura to be a, a proper lady, not like some fancy rich lady, but, you know, there's, there's just, um, you know, certain things that, that ladies aren't supposed to do. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you're not supposed to work out in the fields with the men, but sometimes Laura would help me uh, when we were out there cutting hay. And I have a tool for doing that. Uh, this is a scythe, so th this is what you cut down grass with, and then you you dry it into hay so that you can you can store it up for your animals over the winter. And uh, we have a special one of these as well for harvesting grain with, and it's called a cradle scythe, and it's got it looks like a cradle mounted onto it. It's these wooden fingers that help to cradle the grain. Because uh, when you're cutting grain down, you need to bundle it into sheaves, and, and that helps you keep it together for, for bundling. When you're cutting hay, you can uh, not, you don't have to be quite as neat with that, and you just have to pick it up with a pitchfork. And I've got one here that uh, I made this myself. You know, when you're a pioneer, you try to make a lot of your tools out of wood that you can. You can get pitchforks made with metal. But uh, this one doesn't cost anything because I, I just carved it myself from, from a branch. And uh, one thing that pioneers sometimes use is the sickle. Uh, the cradle side is faster for harvesting, but for pioneers, a lot of times your fields still have stumps in them. And uh, well, not if you're on the prairie though, but if you're living in the in the forest, you got stumps to worry about, and if you're swinging swinging a scythe around, uh, chances are you're going to hit a stump now and then. Uh, so if you want to make sure that you can get close to those stumps without wrecking your your tool, uh, then this one is better. And you grab the grain with one hand and cut with the other. It's a lot slower, but when you're a pioneer, you know it's it's more important to get the, as much food as you can. And, and the speed of it is not always the most important thing to consider. Well, one more thing you might find interesting. Uh, this is my wife's dinner horn. And I know it's getting close to dinner time anyway, so this is very appropriate. Uh, because the men are, are working out in the fields, uh, you know, we might be far from home. And uh, a lot of times, you know, uh, if you're in the a forest, you're cutting trees down. Out on the prairie, we're, we're trying to um, plow the, the prairie grass under to, to make fields. And uh, this is how my wife lets me know that it's time to come in for dinner. 
That sound will travel for quite some distance, and uh, that's how I know it's time to, to head home. <clears throat> All right, so um, yeah, any anything else uh, before we head for dinner? No, I think I think that the dinner bell rang, and it's uh, it's been really great to meet you and talk to you about life in pioneer times. And for those students who um, would like to, you know, go back and read your daughter's books, they're awesome. And we're just so privileged to be able to talk to somebody who is so famous in our time. Well, that's funny. I never thought I would be famous. I don't think I deserve to be famous, but but I'm flattered. Nonetheless, and it was great to talk with you people in the future. Sounds like you're doing a great job there in the future. So uh, keep up the good work. Okay, thanks. Take care. Thanks, Charles. Everybody. See you guys for the, um, we'll see a tarantula soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, bye.